the Godhead are living in an endless duration of time and have successions of thoughts, experiences, and volitions or a chronology of events in their existence. This is a statement based upon the conclusions that we find in the many, many passages of the scripture. Here's a good question for us to think about at the moment. As we prayed this morning, let me ask you, when did God hear that prayer? During my college days, when I first came to the Lord as a boy, I always assumed that God heard me pray or saw the prayer in my heart when it was prayed. And I always assumed that prayer was an invitation for the thoughtfulness of God to consider my condition and what he might want to do with me. I always assumed that God was working with me in my duration because I can't conceive how a personality can function without a succession of time. At the present moment, we're at a different succession of time than when we began. I have no conception whatever as to how a personality can function without a duration, without a succession. And when I come to prepare for the Lord's work, my godly professors say, well, the prayer you uttered this morning was heard by God billions of years ago. In fact, there never was a time in, his all, in, every, in existence when he didn't hear this prayer because God can't have any new observations that he never had before. There can't be anything that will ever happen that he doesn't know in the tiniest detail. And uh, don't you know, the professor said, that uh, God is an eternal now, lives in the past, present, and future all at once, Time is such a reality with us, but not with God. And so a great weight settled down over my mind. Because I couldn't see how prayer would change anything if everything was residing in the mind of God from all eternity and there would be no changes whatsoever. That the day of our entrance into the world was a fixity. The day of our death is a fixity. How could it be different than it will be? In fact, it's not only what will be, it is what is. I carried this load for a few years. When I got out into the ministry and was laboring in a pastorate, 32, 33, I remember one Sunday afternoon, this thing really came to a climax. We're out to a, a place for dinner. There were some, love, some young people in the, in the gathering there who were going to come to the meeting at night. I thought, well, I'll go down to the cornfield and, and try to have a meeting with the Lord over this matter, asking the Lord to guide and help me to say something that will change the destiny of these young people. And, of course, I took my theology with me. And you never can overcome the devastating sights that you may have, can you? And here I am trying to pray and wait upon God. Uh, don't you know that God is living billions of years in the future? Just as well as billions of years in the past? Don't you know that God sees the souls that you're praying about? He doesn't see them as possibilities. He sees them as actualities. There they are. If he sees them in the beautiful destiny of rest, why should you be uncomfortable here in your prayer? 
if he sees them in the awful pain of the agony of mind of the lost, as actual existence is now, how do you think you're going to change what is already a reality in the great being of God? Now you can just see what happened to that prayer. But I did resolve that someday I'm going to have to hazard to some extent my faith and really get alone with God and see whether I'm supposed to believe a thing like this. And of course, if you have a problem that has no solution, the less you know about the problem, the better off you are. Have you ever heard any earnest servant of the Lord say this? I don't want to preach theology, I want to preach Christ. This is a testimony that this person has run into some loggerheading problems in theology and is trying to steer away from it. Of course, there's no wisdom in this because theos is the word for God, so theology is simply what is true about God. And so I determined that someday I was going to really see whether I have to believe a thing like this, which was such a devastation. I had on my wall, prayer changes things. I couldn't in my mind see how prayer could change things. And so a great heavy weight was imposed upon my mind by loving, God-fearing professors. This is what they were taught. This is what they were teaching. And so we have an immensity here. Uh, we see the situation briefly by this little sketch, do we not? We have the time reality line here, don't we? Here's the idea of a duration. This is not in your manual. We have our entrance upon the scene of time, the birth point, moral accountability, our death point, and here we have the present. With that, there's a past, is there not? And there's a future, but supposedly not with God, because God is supposedly existing right now. Now, how can I be intelligent in fellowship? Fellowship is an inner reaction of personalities, isn't it? a communication. And, and if I am going to conceive that, that God doesn't live in, in the duration of time that I'm in, how can I conceive of fellowship? And so here becomes a great issue, does it not? And that's what this reading I'd referred to. Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about this matter. And if you look at this summary, you'll see an amazing mass of scripture that indicates that God does live in a succession of time. And that there's a genuine past with God, there's a genuine present with God, and there's a genuine future with God. What is future has not come yet. What is past has been accomplished. This is Bible. There is no question about this whatsoever. And having made my decision with my friends who were influenced by liberal and philosophical concepts, I want to see what God has to say in the Bible. Uh, we should take a few minutes here uh, to review some philosophical speculations and how this all came about. You can read about it a little further in one of these uh, notebooks I have. We just have a few summarizing thoughts. And this will be available for you. It is so tragic that early in church history, we have the influence of philosophers coming into the church. 
And this brought complication. In, in the early church experience, you go back to the early church writings. You don't find these complications. You don't find it in the Bible itself, do you? And Paul gives a very severe warning in Colossians 2.8. And this is something to remember. Some of you are going on to educational processes. And this might be worth an awful lot to keep on considering this passage. Because I'm old enough to have observed some devastations in the lives of young, earnest Christians. Some of whom thought they could make it by being exposed to all these philosophical assumptions. Now there's no doubt that God calls some earnest biblical scholars to get involved in all the philosophical arguments so there might be a foundation of approach to answer them. But I'm as sure as I'm alive that most of us are not to get involved in all of these speculations. And this is not a part of Christian witness. We simply don't need to answer all the speculations of philosophers. We are sent out, as we've said, to, to show the confidence, the trustfulness, the relaxation. We're, we're sent out to testify what dear Jesus and the gospel has done for us. And we don't need to answer all the arguments of speculators. We have to tell them what the solution of things are. And so it is rather dangerous to get involved in this situation. So Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceptions, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. This is a very sad verb. It means to carry off as a booty, to carry you off as a prize. And it's a present tense. Beware lest philosophers are carrying you off as prizes and through their empty deceptions and their word abilities and, and all these cyclic uh, processes of reasoning which always come back to some assumptions, as I have said. And these are the traditions of men and not according to the revelations of God. And so a very sad thing happened in the early church. You, you look at uh, Colossians 2 and verse 3. Verse 2 talks about the Lord Jesus, God's mystery, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so God has given us through revelation the fundamental things we need to know to live a happy, devoted life for our precious Lord. And we do not need to go and bow in abeyance to all the secular learning of scholars who have not submitted to Jesus. Now, I have made a very rigorous rule in my life in this manner. Never to get involved with any theologian or any philosopher who does not give evidence of a total, submissive, intelligent relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as sure as you're alive, if you get involved with his wordings or her wordings, you're going to have a bondage put upon your mind, and you're always going to carry this, and you'll never have the beautiful freedom that God intended us to have. These, my friends, may be words of wisdom to some. And the church was not satisfied with this, so they had to begin bowing down to Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Around 478 B.C. was the birth of Socrates, and then we have Plato following and, and uh, Aristotle. And uh, this influenced a compromise in the thinking of the church. Look at Paul's principle here. Look at his presentation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.2. The second chapter of 1 Corinthians is very important for us to remember, isn't it? In our representing Christ. Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I determined, he said, in my presentation to narrow it down to the story of the adventure of God in reconciliation. So Paul would go back to the Old Testament. He would try to show what sin did and, and God is operating and trying to rescue. And he gave these prophecies. He had these plans 
uh, of reaching the world with knowledge and dear Paul. In other words, you can never be saved with Paul unless you spend a whole lot of hours with him. And he would go over the prophecies of the Messiah and the suffering of Jesus and all and the way Jesus was treated, his life, his teaching, and his sacred atonement, his resurrection, and the whole scheme of truth. So Paul says, I determined, although he's a great philosopher and has exposure to all of these things, he said, I determined to, to present what the Word of God is trying to say as to the needs of individuals. And so we have a tragedy coming in. They were no longer satisfied with the simple things. They said, well, we need to scratch our heads and, and get real curious of different ideas. And here we have uh, God's command, call men every, ma every man to repent. And this is a present tense here, to have a change of mind in such a thoroughness that you're going to stay changed. And this is what God is calling. And look at the power of the early church. Uh, when the, the Christians came in the early church days, the ungodly are fearful. You read about this in Acts 17, 6, don't you? These men have upset the world and have come here also, and there's no telling how they're going to completely upset our city. In other words, there was a dynamic power in the early church, an energy that was not a speculative philosophy presentation like we have such an admixture. So as I see it, we come upon the scene with a 10-foot snowball of theology. And in the center of this snowball is the basic revelations of truth that God wants us to have. So really, the Spirit of God has moved upon me to make it a sincere effort to put this great big snowball in the oven of God's testing. This, to try to get down as close as possible to the core of simple revealed truth. And this is what the world needs to hear about. The simple truth of God. As God is trying to reach out and to, and to bring about this. Uh, there were certain movements in the early church. Uh, we can't go through this history. We have some earnest, real earnest converts who were philosophers. And they brought in the idea of the contribution of philosophers. They didn't intend to bring damage into the thinking of the church, to be sure. But they most assuredly did this. And so you have the area of speculation. You have, as we refer to Origen, a very dynamic person who had some very defective views on the, on the trinity of, of Godhead and the true incarnation of the Lord Jesus and so on and wrote all these visionary concepts of, of uh, what, they re what he read and imagined what they might mean. And so here is an, here's an utter a philosophical complication. So now people are filling their minds with words instead of understanding. Do you distinguish between these two? God doesn't send us out with words. The words of the Bible we send are the means of understanding. And we must come to some concepts of truth that are simple. And this is what the world needs as a solution. So you have a great change. Around 313, Constantine professes to become a Christian. And uh, now you might not die for your faith like you did previously. And by 380, Christianity becomes the official church of the Roman Empire. And here, as I see it, is the great development of theological speculation. If you and I might die the next week for our faith, we're going to have to have more than a set of ideas, aren't we? We've got to have an experience of vitality with God. We've got to know that salvation is real. We've got to have the witness of the Holy Spirit. We've got to know we pass from death unto life. A set of ideas isn't going to help us. 
And if we were in the, in the den of lions, in the arena now, and we heard the roaring of the lions, and, and the leader said, you can get out of this place if you want to. And if all we've got is a set of ideas, you think we're going to sing unto the Lord and, and rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ in the, in the face of death? And so the early church was kept pure because of persecution, but not because popular. And here we have the rise of the clergy who got to have a lot of time to talk about some nice things now. And they can't have Peter coming with his demonstrated uh, presentation of simplicity, nor Paul. We've got to have something complicated now. We've got a lot of complicated theological ideas uh, coming into the church. And so we can see something tragic, which looked like a good thing, but really it led to great uh, tragedy and great damage. And so they began to tamper with the concept of God. They began to sit up and think, uh, does God live in a duration like we do? And, and the philosophers uh, tried to solve everything, as we said, and, and in doing this, they, they make unending, impossible contradictions and devastations to try to disturb and grapple the mind. And you have to say these things over and over again till you get a wisdom of words and you think you have the solution because there is much saying. And so we have different, the concept of God now must not be in time. He must be an eternal philosophical existence of some kind. And, and God can't be thought of as having new accessions of knowledge either. It must be that, he, that everything he ever did know he always did. Now here's a good thing to think about. Let me ask you. Can God today have a thought that he never had before? Theology says no. There never was a time when God ever did have a thought that he never had before. Then the only conclusion I can come to, you not only have faith applied to man, but you have faith applied to God. And can you imagine such a devastation that comes upon the mind? And so all kinds of complicated ideas came to be interjected to confuse and bring in problems. We will mention the matter of free will and Augustine a little later in our lectures. We are considering the duration of God as revealed in the Bible and how philosophy sadly entered into the thinking of the church. And here are two diametrically opposite approaches. The concept of the philosophers is self-sufficiency. We don't need any divine revelation. Let's think out our problems. We can handle everything. Our minds are supreme. We're not going to accept any professed re revelation. We're going to decide what we're going to accept and believe. It's our minds that are uh, supreme in conclusion. The concept of Christianity has been that man has so encumbered his mind in rebellion against God that he just uh, lacks the clarity to think out his situation. And so man is dependent on God to straighten him out in his thinking. And this has been the long process of revelation, starting way back with Adam and Eve and, and on the early leaders of the enterprise of reconciliation. And so here are two opposite approaches. Uh, and uh, it was a sad day as we've said, when uh, philosophy began to get more power in the church as Christianity became popular. And you wouldn't have to pay much now to be a Christian, so it was a popular thing. And we have to have some complications then to talk about. We can't have simple things requiring submission to God. And so you can see the, the rise of the clergy as a separate group of privileged individuals who were supposed to be looked up to. And the idea of ministry as Jesus gave us is not the idea of an elevated clergy because Jesus said, I'm among you as one that serveth. He said, I didn't come to be ministered to. I came to minister and to give my life a ransom for many. And so the call of God was a call to ministry and service. 
But now we have a, a concept of supremacy coming into the more and more popular view. And so they conceive that God must not be in a duration of time. He must be some kind of a being apart from time. And, uh, of course, there can't be any new observations in the experience of God, so he must know every single I.O. to every detail. Now, remember, friends, you cannot have a knowledge of the big things without a total knowledge of the little things, because the big things result from the little things. And so this is a tremendous thing to ask anybody to believe. And so here we have the, the, the situation. There's no succession of thoughts then. It was affirmed in the divine being. Everything is one grand expression of some sort. And of course, the net result is God's removed from our conscious understanding. We can have no understanding how there would be an existence of a being of this dimension and so on. So this has a deadening effect upon, our spirit, upon the spiritual life. As complications came in, which God never intended, of course, to be. And so, after a very, very extensive study of what the Scripture has to say, gathering hundreds and hundreds of passages, we've come to select a few here to represent the ideas that seem to be what the Bible has to say in the matter. And so we have our proposition, which we have affirmed that the Godhead are revealed in the Bible as living in an endless duration of time, having a succession of thoughts, experiences, and volitions, or a genuine chronology, a historical order of events in their existence. And uh, we just take a few scriptures here. We have some general statements of this matter of time. We have our limitations to a few uh, illustrations of these various passages we have twice in the book of Revelation the simple statement of the past, present, and future with God. An example is Revelation 1.8. I'm Alpha and Omega. These are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, as you realize. Says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty, giving us the concept that there is a present with God. There was a past, and there is a future. The future is not now. There is a present with God as well as with us, if we're going to understand this. Then we have the idea of reasoning, uh, many times uh, illustrated and represented concerning God. Now, you can't reason without a duration, can you? The reasoning process requires a succession. You have one thought here, then you have another thought here, then you draw a conclusion. You can't have a reasoning process without a duration, can you? And so God is represented as reasoning so many, many times in the Bible. And we think of that greatest expression, uh, Isaiah 1:18, where God invites man, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. And he wants to reason upon the wonderful blessings of reconciliation. We have uh, emotions represented concerning God. And oh, what a study this is. This, my friends, revolutionized my whole concept of the being of God. This reading I referred to was in 1938, so we've had a lot of time to digest and appreciate these wonderful things. And as I set aside a whole vacation time now to read the whole Bible through in about 12 or 13 days, 17 hours a day generally, just getting away from the world of business and responsibility, and just trying to get along with God during this vacation time. And just praying that the Spirit of God may move us out of this old world into the domain of God's being and help us to learn what we can learn about the operations of God. And this was the most serene period of time in my life. We all should have extended periods of time when we draw away from the world and uh, try to avoid any disturbance because it takes you a half a day to get your mind in order if we have different business responsibilities and different responsibilities in life. And, and if you disturb this order, then it's another period of time before you get back. So there must be some kind of a period of time in our lives when we will have a concentrated evaluation of the secrets of God. And there came out of this reading such a restfulness such a blessed concept of the being of God 
And the greatest thing probably was the concept of emotion in God. I thought I found a hundred passages or so in the Bible that express the brokenheartedness and grief of God over man's sin. In my theology, I was taught this is kind of arbitrary. God, this is here. He did something else there. Did something else here. Nobody's supposed to ask any questions. These are the simple things that are taking place. I never got the idea of my theological training that God was sensitive and that he, he was limited in what he wanted to do and he was grieved in the depth of great divine consciousness over the way man had treated him. And this draws us out with such sympathy. Now, my friends, this is a sympathy that comes out of intelligence. We have all kinds of approaches toward worship, many of which are, is, is not a development of worship based on intelligent understanding of facts. There is so often an endeavor to lift men's minds above theological complications into the area of emotional worship. And this is very temporary and very ineffective. But when we sit down and learn something about God and really are satisfied about something about God, there comes such an automatic, spontaneous response of drawing out of our personality. And so with such a deep, Movement. You notice if you looked ahead in our manual, the consequences of sin. Number one consequence we represent is not what sin did to man, but what sin did to God. I was never taught this in any theological presentation. And yet this is exactly the deep, affectionate revelation of the scripture. What sin did to the plans of God and the great bounty of the love of God is an utter Colossal tragedy, the greatest tragedy that a God of love and hope and purpose should be so disappointed that little tiny man doesn't want any more exposure into the endless dimensions of the infinite divine being. It is unthinkable that man should be so stupid and so rebellious. And to think that God has a consciousness of all he has to give man and little tiny man doesn't want it. And so God's consciousness of his love builds up a pressure in the divine being. And this brings the intensity of sorrow and disappointment that the scripture reveals. Oh, my friend, praise the Lord. What this did to me, it drew my heart out in worship and sympathy with God. And we say, oh, Lord, I'm just a tiny little speck of a personality in your little world here. But one thing I can do is make one little contribution toward your happiness. I can't control what other people do, but we can have one place in, our, in God's existence where God is not going to have sorrow and disappointment. And here then we have the greatest motivation to live for God, to contribute to the happiness of God. And I like this part of section 11 where we talk about continuation in the love of God. And so the Bible reveals the sorrow and disappointments of God. Oh, how deep there could be nothing greater expressed than you have in Genesis 6. Here God has one single person on earth who wants to have an exposure of mind. And so as God is represented, going from mind to mind. Do you want me today? No, I'm busy. How about you? Do you want me to? No, I'm inventing evil. I can't be bothered with you. Then, then what about you? Do you want me today? No, I'm busy. Uh, and so on. And here God goes from mind to mind, and he finds one who is interested in opening up the personality to him. And he is grieved in his heart, and he repents that man had been created. And, and we study, we give you later on a study of the Hebrew word that is translated repent. It is regret. It is a deep pathos of sorrow that man had been created since this devastating result happened. And now God is reduced. This would be something for many theologians to think about who say that God's will is being done. Could anybody conceive it to be God's will and plan that there should be one on earth who would respond to him? That would be a very strange deduction, is, wouldn't it? And so as we see the tender and the cape pathos of God, what a moving situation. Uh, we can't just but say a couple of things here. 
Here we have Abraham. You know, he's God's plan to build a nation uh, through Abraham. He can't reach the world to an individual. He has to build a nation. And uh, he made these many promises to Abraham. And, and here, finally, Isaac comes on the scene. And uh, now he is apparently near 20 in this area. And now God says, I want you, Abraham, to take him up and offer him on the altar there. And early in the morning, no consecration necessary. He's busy to do what God told him to do, this terrible, terrible, awful thing, to take uh, this heir of the promises and everything looks like everything's going to collapse now uh, because everything is wrapped up in Isaac now and take him and offer him. And you know the story, how he couldn't have been compelled to do this, so there must have been a confidence in Isaac as well as Abraham. And here he, he's going to do just exactly what God says, no matter what the consequences are. So here it comes to the point of an altar, uh, where is the sacrifice, they said, as they walked up. Well, uh, it, was, it was going to be different this time. And here we have Isaac all bound and on the altar. And Abraham takes his knife, going right on through with this matter of this terrible, terrible thing that God told him to do. And then we have some excitement on the part of God. Isn't that remarkable? How would you plot the emotions of God? Would you have a straight line with no new discoveries? Is this the way the Bible represents it? No, we read in Genesis 22, 12, excitement on the part of God. And as he sees Abraham going through, down comes the vestige. Do not stretch your hand out your hand upon the land and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. So if I read a story like this, God makes a discovery. And he sees his servant doing this terrible thing. And he says, no, I sure no. <laughs> There's nothing in your life you won't do. And so God has pleasure. He has a great emotional pleasure over this because he's making an observation. Is everything going to be routine? There must be a reason why people want 20-minute sermons, don't you think? As you study the glorious revivals of the past where great truth was discussed, and great presentations were made in a, in a powerful anointing of the Holy Spirit. You find people wanting to stay, to listen to God's word, and to hear these explanations of excitement. And so we see God has tender emotions, do we not? We have that lovely little song, uh, Zephaniah 317, and that's such a sweet thing, isn't it? Uh, but this talks about the deep emotions of God, doesn't it? The Lord your God in the midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He just wants to relax with us as we love him and worship him. He'll rejoice over you with shouts of joy or singing. Are we going to allow God to have emotion? Are we going to have, allow God to have experiences? You see what has happened? Theology has frozen over our concept of the living God and has made our, our life of devotion a complexity. And we don't see the intelligence of what we're supposed to be doing. To allow God to live in a duration of time and have these sensitivities, ha have these expectations, what's he going to do now in this opportunity? And then have them rise up. We'd like to talk about Job. There was an argument in heaven. Uh, the devil came up and said one day, you haven't got anybody down there that loves you. Why, they're just, doing, they're just good to you because of what you're doing for them. So a big argument comes up in heaven. Because yes, I have. Have you considered Job? And God has fences around all of us. Let's be careful that we don't attribute our spiritual victory to ourselves, or God may take down some of the fences and show us where we stand. This is what God had to do with Peter, wasn't it? He says, I'm great. I'm great different than all the rest of them. And God had to take down the fences of Peter and show how, how weak Peter was. All right, here's some fences around Job. And the devil says, the trouble is you don't give me enough rope here. You give me some more rope, but we'll show you that he doesn't love you. And you know the story, the rest of it. And then it comes, Job, <laughs> he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And so God says to the devil, who wins the argument? <laughs> Look what you did. You moved me to take down all these fences and, and allow all this terrible catastrophe to come to my servant, Job, just because you didn't believe me. And God can point to the devil, and the devil goes off in defeat like he always does. Are we going to allow God to live in a duration of time, to, to have excitement over us as his little children? Or are we going to have these great big immensities 
of concepts with all their long words and discussions. Oh my, praise God, it's hard to, uh, to not keep right on as we feel the blessings of the Lord in this area. And so we have different acts of, of, of activities that God has uh, uh, expressed himself in. We have the whole process of creation, do we not? When God did specific things at specific uh, times. And uh, we have an instance of this in the, a, a, a repeat of this, we might say, in Exodus 31, 17. And here we have God uh, doing certain things in past and then, then looking back over something he had done. Obviously, there is a duration with God, or how could he do things at specific periods of time, and how could he look backward over what had been accomplished? So we have the simple statement here. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, 3117, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. This is back to the first chapter of Genesis, and God saw that all that he'd made, and behold, it was very good. And so God completes the operations of creation and looks backward in admiration over what has been done. How would he do this if there's not a genuine chronology, of course, in the operations of God? And so we see some very simple things coming up as we get to the Scripture. Uh, God has care and oversight over us as his children. And what a sweet uh, idea this is. Uh, we have a passage here in Deuteronomy 23, 14, which is a very sensitive passage from God's heart. And he wants to live with us and help us in every situation, doesn't he? But it depends upon our attitude toward him. Since the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp, to deliver you and to defeat your enemies before you. Therefore your camp must be holy, that he may, must not see anything indecent among you, lest he turn away from you. So the concept is God is living with us in our duration, and he's, he's making observations of our reaction, and he's making up his plans uh, to do for us what he can in accordance with our actions. And so we see the, the lovely representation of God's heart. Uh, God has made many decisions and changed his mind in decisions. Uh, we'll have a little more at reference to this later on. Uh, here you have the uh, second of Exodus uh, 23 and 25 where Israel is under this awful persecution in Egypt and, and God sees their stress and he decides to deliver them. And uh, we have later on the terrible catastrophe of the golden calf. This is one of the most dreadful things you can think of in the treatment of God. We all know the story. Moses is up on the mount with God to receive the sacred revelations. And here they've erected this calf. They got this idea from Egypt, remember? Egypt had the, the cattle god idea and the golden uh, uh, images of the cattle and uh, so on. Says, so, well, let's do the same thing. And so they're dancing around this thing. And this is the God that did all these things. Yeah, here's the God that brought us over the Red Sea. And, my, 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 can you conceive of such a, an apostasy? And God says to Moses, you better get down and see something terrible is going on down here. You better get down and see what's going on. So Moses carries the tables of the law written in the finger of God. And when he comes down below the cloud and sees all this carrying on, it just breaks his heart. He takes the tables and just smashes them down. And, then, and it seems like he made another trip up to God, another 40 days, and the intimation is that he didn't say anything for 40 days. We can't exactly prove this, but it seems that this is the picture that is given to us. So he falls upon his face before God, and he's sympathizing with God. Remember, God had said, now, Moses, I can't take any more. This is the end of Israel. I'm going to start all over again with you. You're going to replace Abraham now in my plans. I can't take any more of this action. And then Moses, in his humility, humbles. And here we have the great prayer. If you read in the 32nd of Exodus, don't you? And 33rd, and you have the great unfinished prayer with a dash in your day. This is where I think Moses was so full of tears in sympathy with God that he couldn't pray anymore. This is the way we must pray, isn't it? In sympathy with God. Never pray in sympathy 
with anyone in revolt against God. Let us always take God's side and be sympathetic with Him in His great movement. Oh my, what a meaning. God said, I have no more patience with this. Uh, I just can't take any more of this. And it's going to be a big change. And Moses intercedes. Isn't this moving and exciting? Verse 18, Deuteronomy 9, and I fell down. Deuteronomy is the second law, isn't it? In other words, Deuteronomy is a repetition of what happened. It's such a beautiful, rich, spiritual book, isn't it? Because the main spiritual ideas of the previous books of, of the Pentateuch are reviewed here. And so this is a review of what Moses experienced. He said, I fell down before the Lord as at first, 40 days and night. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin which you committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was wrathful against you in order to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me that time also. And you have in the other record of Exodus 32 how the Lord repented of what he said he was going to do and he did it not. Oh my, do we see the, the movement of God's being? Do we see the sensitivity, the decisions of the great being of God? My, what a moving book the Word of God becomes as we try to get simple and read it as it is stated. And, and see the, the dramatic uh, activity here in the presence of God. Uh, we can't go on to these others at the present. Uh, we, we have the concept of Saul being chosen to be king. And uh, how God uh, had to repent of this when Saul revolted. We have Jonah uh, and the great repentance of, of uh, Nineveh. And how God repented of the judgment he said he was going to send and he didn't send it. So we have these different illustrations, many, many illustrations, don't we, throughout the precious Word of God. Now we come to the clincher of the whole matter. Because now we have some changes in the internal relationships of the Godhead. And my, if some scholars don't grapple with this and say certain great impossible uh, expressions, it seems to me, this little chart is not in your notes, if you would be looking for it. It'll be available here for you. Here we have a brief chart of the interchangeable relationships of the Godhead. We quoted in our last lecture, John 1.1, 1, 1, where the Lord Jesus said that he was with the Father from eternity. Then uh, we speak of, of John 17.5, uh, where... Uh, Jesus said in his closing prayer, uh, I, I now have finished the work. And, and he talks about the fellowship which he had with the Father before the world was. So here's something that was past and it is not now present. And then we have the different statements here. Uh, we might uh, read Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 here. A great new adventure is going to take place in time God talked uh, to uh, the people and to the nation in, in many ways. After God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, in many portions in these ways, in these latter days has spoken to us of his son, and so on. And uh, we might read Galatians 4, uh, 4 and 5. These are very graphic statements and, and indicate a change in the interpersonal relationships and positions of the Godhead. Verse 4, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son. When the fullness of time came, God did something. He sent forth his Son, uh, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So here is the period of time, and then here is the great adventure. And then, dear Jesus says in, in 638 of John, I came down from heaven, a past tense. There was a time past, uh, not too far before this, when I came, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He came down from heaven and so on. 
And we could read so many, many passages. Then we have John 1, uh, 14. He tented or dwelt among us for a period of time, didn't he? And uh, so things developed to a very climactic way. And they're resolving to get rid of him. Look at what you read in Luke 22, uh, 69, for example. Now Jesus is under the awful stress of the way he's treated. And now he, he is talking about leaving them. And notice there's going to be a change now. He said, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And then we have his sacred atonement, and then we have his resurrection. And they saw him go to heaven. And when he went to heaven, he took a resurrected human body with him. Now somewhere in the universe is a place called heaven. We'll mention this in the next heading here. And in the place called heaven is the center of God's domain. Here is the concentration of the Trinity in their operations, in regulating the moral universe. And now a change is going to happen because there's going to be added to the center of domain of the Trinity a human resurrected body. You remember Stephen was given to see this in his dying moments. He looked up into heaven and he saw the Lord Jesus having arisen as the verb seems to indicate. In other words, dear Jesus rose to receive him. So how do you put this together if there's not a chronology with God, you see? These are changes in the interpersonal relationships of the Godhead. And no kind of escapism of theological juggling can seem to avoid this firm, simple statement of fact. Then we have something new is going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to be given in this new wonderful era in which we are privileged to live. No matter how much they prayed in gospel times, they could not have the blessings that you and I are supposed to have. Jesus made this very clear. For example, in John 7, 37 to 39, in the last year of his ministry, apparently, he talks about the glorious relationship in the Holy Spirit. But he said, you can't have it yet. This he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. We'll see some reasons next week why God could not bless in time past, like he can now bless. But they could not have this new glorious thing that was going to take place until the sacred atonement had been accomplished with its profound moral force of humiliation so God can bless more than he ever could bless before. And then you have the great advent of Pentecost when something new is beginning. Remember Jesus said in John 14, 17, the Holy Spirit is with you but he's going to be in you after it is all accomplished. So something new in intimacy of the Holy Spirit is going to start after Jesus had finished his atonement and had been raised from the dead and ascended. So Peter explains Pentecost in Acts 2.33, doesn't he? Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. So here's a genuine chronology when something had to be done before the new procedure could start. And now we have the new wonderful era in which we are, the age of the Holy Spirit, which is an age of intimacy. We're not supposed to need rules and regulations in this age because we're supposed to have such a new intimacy with dear sweet Jesus 
in the Holy Spirit. And remember, you know you have the presence of the Holy Spirit when you have the realization of the resurrected living Christ. Remember, the Holy Spirit does not testify of himself. Jesus said he'll take the things of mine, make them real to you. So when we have a, a resurrected concept of the serenity of the glorious resurrected Christ and his lovely love and power and dynamic, this is what the Holy Spirit recreates in our mind. So we're supposed to walk by sensitivity now to God, not by rules and regulations. My own mind. What a precious revelation of truth the Lord gives us here. And so we're in this wonderful age, the gifts and operations of the Holy Spirit. Then there's going to come an end to this. As Jesus went away, he said he's coming back. And so there's going to be a great kingdom age, as revealed, when God is going to rule upon earth by force. And there's going to be absolute righteousness. This is future. We have all these different prophecies. The prophecies of the Old Testament. The prophecies of the New. The great details of the book of Revelation. Which apparently is the way God's going to wind up this earthly rebellious situation that we find ourselves in. Now how do you put all this together without a genuine chronology? Why should we want to avoid this? And look at our high priest. Philippians 2 is a lovely chapter, isn't it? You have in verse 8 to 10 the humiliation of Jesus. Uh, a little previous to that. Then you have in 9 to 11 the, the resurrection and glory of Jesus. And now he's higher than he ever was before. And now he's our ever living high priest to intercede for us. All the beautiful concepts. So uh, how do you put this together without a simple concept of the duration of and experiences of God. And oh, how moving it becomes when we just begin to read. Now, maybe some of you have never read any other manner in the New Testament, and you're to be blessed if you haven't had some of these problems. Uh, but we have some great complexities in other minds that have been greatly stumbled by these many issues. God is making various plans, is he not? And uh, these are still future. Some of them have happened, some have not yet. And God has made all kinds of decisions, as we said, what he's going to do in the future. And uh, we have different prophecies given. Uh, 1 Samuel 2.35 has to do with Jesus appeared. God, he, God says, I will raise up a high priest who will fulfill what I want to be done, and so on. Dear Daniel, what a serenity to read about him. He gets down before the Lord, and the Lord gives him all kinds of secrets, doesn't he, of what God plans to do. So God, God tells I plan to raise this nation up. Then I plan to raise another nation up. Then I plan to raise another nation. And dear Daniel's all excited as the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Do you think he'd rather be out in sin and then down before the Lord? My, talk about excitement. And when we give our little lives to dear Jesus and feel the pulse of his heart, Anything compared with this? You say, certainly no. And so here we have many plans that God has revealed. Then in the first Jerusalem conference, Acts 15, uh, James uh, rises up to explain what God is doing. And so in between these mountain peaks, he is calling out the church, both from Jews and Gentiles, anyone who will submit to God. Uh, he's calling out and formulating the church. So we have these different uh, wonderful revelations, don't we, concerning God's operation. And then Jesus said, I'm coming back like you saw me go into heaven. And, and I'm not much concerned with all the arguments on the eschatology problems, whether there's a premillennial coming or a mid, a, a premillennial, I should say pre-tribulation coming, a mid-tribulation, a post-tribulation. There seems to be obviously a premillennial coming when Jesus is going to come. Now, our marching orders, as I said, occupy till I come whenever that is. Let's be so busy trying to win souls and try to bring souls into the heart of God. And when dear Jesus comes back, may he find us busy for himself. 
and not spending our time arguing about all kinds of little details which you really don't need to know. Let's just keep busy for dear sweet Jesus and trying to represent the nature of God and trying to get souls to listen to the wonderful things of God and get make God happy with souls being reconciled and make the souls happy when they're reconciled and we get off to decide and watch the happiness of God and man. This is the beautiful privilege we have, is it not? And so rather than getting into some of these long uh, controversies and all the bitternesses and the things that are said, and my, you wouldn't think there were Christians talking to each other oftentimes. And this is very pitiful, isn't it? When God says, then let's march out and, and try to reach the souls of individuals and, and bring them into the heart of God. I'm glad this has been the thing the Lord has impressed me upon uh, through the years. So we've got so much to be busy for, haven't we? in our wonderful opportunity. Now look at the bottom of your page five and we have a summary paragraph which nobody can possibly argue with because it's simply a statement of what the Bible says here. Uh, they may argue with the first sentence. The theological dogma, dogma is a good word. It merely means a statement of an idea or a principle that is thought to be true. The theological dogma that God is an eternal now or that time or succession is not an element in the divine existence is evidently a philosophical rather than a biblical concept. But now we have the next sentence which nobody can possibly disagree with. In the Bible, God is presented as a living being who walks or dwells with men, performs definite acts at definite times, who rests. Now, he doesn't rest because he's weary. He rests to contemplate his wisdom and his action, who rests, observes, thinks, and his reasons with remembers, is grieved, is jealous, is provoked to anger, and then causes his wrath to rest, is moved with compassion, who forgives and comforts, delights and rejoices, hearkens unto men, repents, changes his plans, makes new decisions, and so forth. These various acts, states of mind, uh, or experiences obviously conflict and cannot coexist at the same instances in the particular series of events and thus require the chronological element of time for their occurrence. You understand what we mean in this series of events? We have said that God, by virtue of his unthinkable dimensions, can have millions of simultaneous actions toward different situations, but he cannot have contradictory action toward a given situation that's in a duration of time with some changes of activities. I won't go into the next paragraph. This is a, a very, very complicated thing that that some uh, theologians try to say, and they think although God is not living in time, yet he chooses to enter into time. Now, my friends, let's look at it very simply. They've got to have God in time some way because of what we've seen. But now look, if God has no duration to make a choice in, how can he ever choose to enter into anything new? You've got to have a duration to make a choice. If God doesn't have a duration, is eternal now, then how can he ever make a choice to enter into a duration? And so you can see the immensity of some problems that come in when people try to, why not just take what the simple word of God has to say? Praise the Lord. And be sweet and restful about the thing. You don't know how light I felt. After I got through this reading, I said, the conclusion of this reading I referred to, the God of the Bible is not the God of theology like I've been taught. And I felt so strong in the Word of God that move any thousand theologians along you would. I've had my little old feet on the rock of Gibraltar, and I feel there's a stability here because God says so in His Word. 